Hello guys, Rod Saha here, back with another video. In this video, we are going to discuss serverless versus container. Alright, let's get to it. Okay, let's look at what is serverless. Serverless has four key characteristics. One, no servers to provision or manage. Two, it automatically scales with usage. Three, never pay for idle. And number four, highly available. So if we think about it, any service that satisfies these four criteria, we can call it serverless. So what are some of the serverless services? Amazon DynamoDB, API Gateway, Step Functions, Simple Queue Service, and there are more. But for the sake of this video, we are going to talk about the crown jewel of serverless, AWS Lambda. So AWS Lambda is a compute service that lets you run code without provisioning or managing servers. Now, let's take a look at what is container. So container is a standard unit of software that packages up code and all its dependencies. As you can see in this diagram, that the configuration, the actual code, the runtime engine and dependencies are all packaged into a software unit, which is called Docker. And then when you instantiate that Docker into an instance, that's what we call a container. So what's the advantage of this? The advantage is, since everything is packaged up, the application runs quickly and reliably from one computing environment to another. Now let's take a look at some of the popular container orchestrators. We have Kubernetes, Amazon EKS, ECS, and Docker Swarm. If you want to know more in detail about container orchestrator and what is the difference between different container orchestrator like EKS, ECS, Fargate, then take a look at my other video. I will put it in the description. Now that we understand what is serverless and what is container, let's take a look at the environment differences. So for serverless, underlying infrastructure is managed by cloud provider. What does that mean? It means it scales automatically. You do not have to define an auto-scaling group, auto-scaling schema, nothing. And also, you don't have to patch the underlying hardware. The cloud provider takes care of all that. On the container side, users control underlying infrastructure the virtual machine size, operating system, AMI, etc. So what it means is it requires management and orchestration. And you need to make the master node highly available if you are running Kubernetes in EC2, uh, if you have to handle the virtual machine failover, AMI rehydration, etc. Next is, in the serverless environment, you cannot install any software such as web server, app server, right? Because the underlying infrastructure is managed by the cloud provider. However, code libraries can be installed. What I mean by that is, let's say you have a Lambda written in Python, and that Python requires some uh, libraries like such as Twitter API um, or some machine learning scikit-learn. So those libraries, you can package it up uh, with the Lambda zip file. For container, you can install almost any software. And one of the best feature of container is prepackaged images with different softwares are already available. What do I mean by that? Uh, let's say you are a Java developer, and to, to code and test and develop Java, uh, you need some IDEs, some testing tools, uh, you need the Java software installed. So a container with all those components are already available. So all you have to do is grab it and just run it. Next is on the compute power, serverless gives you an option to easily select. 
Uh, so on a slider scale, you can select the memory from 128 megabyte to 3 gigabyte. And as you increase the memory, the CPU also increases. And the time limit is from 1 second to 15 minutes. Here on the container side, uh, adjustment of VM parameters requires some work. What do I mean by that? Once your container is up and running in a virtual machine, uh, think of it as changing EC2 instance type on a running instance. Next is with Lambda, there is no attached hard disk. Deployment packet size limited. There is a temporary storage space available, but it is very, very limited. And there is no permanent uh, storage attached to the Lambda. For container, hard disks are attached to nodes. So what is one of the superpower for serverless? Easier to onboard since you don't have to manage the underlying infrastructure and focus on solving business problem from get go. So basically you think about the business problem, you code it and then you run it. And for the container, the superpower is complete control of environment and rich ecosystem. What do I mean by rich ecosystem? Since you have control of the underlying infrastructure and you can install any software, over time there are multiple tools available to work with container. Now let's take a look at the use case difference. Serverless shines at event-driven architectures and it has native integration with other cloud services. So for example, every time you put an object in S3, you want to do some processing, you can trigger a Lambda from that S3. Same way for Kinesis, every time a message arrives, you want to process it, it's very, very easy to trigger a Lambda and process it. For container, it has faster migration to cloud with other softwares. So for example, you want to run a web server or app server, yep, you can install it in a container and run it. And if your app requires third-party software, container allows you to do that. Whereas in serverless, you cannot do that. Serverless is well suited when traffic is unpredictable. Why? Because it automatically scales and you pay as you go. And container is suited when traffic is predictable. Why is that? Because you pay for the underlying VM regardless and it scales the entire VM. We are going to take a look at this in a little bit more detail in the next slides. So serverless is good for microservices uh, because it has API gateway, gateway integration. Um, and it is good when the code is modular without any software dependencies. And it is easier to migrate cloud native Greenfields applications uh, to serverless. However, you have to consider the VPC call start latency. Container is good for microservices as well. Uh, it's easy to move API with dependencies with container and you have to consider cost and complexity for the Greenfield applications. So in the last slide, we took a look at the superpowers of serverless and container. Now in this one, let's talk about the kryptonite for these two. So for serverless, for brownfield monoliths to lambda, major refactoring is needed. And for containers, the learning curve is steep because there are a multitude of choices. And since you manage the underlying infrastructure, there is significant day two operational overhead. Now let's take a look at scaling of Lambda versus container. So for Lambda, it is pretty straightforward. As the traffic increases to the Lambda, it automatically scales. So that's what it looks like. As the traffic keeps increasing, it just keeps spinning more lambdas and you pay for what you use. Now let's take a look at how container scales. And we are going to use Amazon EKS for this example. So uh, without going into too much detail, 
Um, the container orchestration has a master. The K8 stands for Kubernetes. Uh, so you can think it think of it as basically a bunch of EC2s. And then we have Kubernetes nodes. That's also an EC2. So in those nodes, there are pods. And in those pods, we have our containers, which is running. Uh, so as the traffic increases, it first scales horizontally. What do I mean by that? So when the more traffic comes, it will spin up another pod in this Kubernetes node. But what happens when the traffic increases again? And this EC2 node is already at capacity. So it's going to spin another Kubernetes node, which is basically another EC2, and it's going to spin a pod in it. So as you can see, this node is at 50% utilization. However, you have to pay for the entire EC2. Um, so basically, you pay for idle resources. So I know what you guys are thinking. Hey, Lambda is always cheaper than Kubernetes. But wait before you make up your mind. So let's take a deeper look at costs, OK? So for Lambda, we are going to assume the traffic volume is 3 million per month. Uh, each execution requires 512 megabyte of memory, and each execution takes 300 milliseconds. And the traffic is unpredictable. So if we do the calculation, uh, I'm, I'm going to give a link to the Lambda calculator uh, in the description. You'd see that it's only $1.08 per month for this, which is which is pretty cheap. And on the container side, with the same configuration, you have to pay $144 per month for the control plane and around $14 for a t3.small EC2, which is working as a worker node. So it comes around $160 per month. And cost will increase during higher spike because of scaling. What do I mean by that? Since the traffic is unpredictable, if the traffic is very high, the worker node has to scale, like we discussed on the previous slide. And then you will pay more than this price. Now let's take a look at the next use case, which is, say, 90 million per month, which is the traffic, 512 megabyte of memory, and each execution takes 250 milliseconds. And the traffic is predictable this time. And then the cost comes around 206 per month for Lambda. Now let's take a look at the container. So uh, same parameters, uh, predictable traffic, and everything is same. This time, control plane, the cost is fixed, which is $144 per month. And we pick a T3 that medium worker node, which is around 29 bucks a month. So it comes around 173 bucks a month. So see, in this case, the container is cheaper than Lambda. Why? Because predictable traffic makes it possible to select proper VM, and the CPU utilization could be higher. So the very important thing is one is not cheaper or pricier than the other. It all depends on the use case. So what are my parting words, and what is the verdict? So I know we love to compare stuff in the current world. So we started the video as serverless versus container. But as you saw, in one use case, serverless might be better. And some other use cases, container can be better. So always do your analysis, compare the pros and cons, and do the cost analysis before you select one or the other. All right, guys. That is the video. If you like this video, smash that like button and click subscribe. All right, see you guys later. Bye.